identify with uh, being American. It's it's not something that you can take away from me just by deporting me. When I was in the military, uh, I was sent to um, places like uh, Abu Dhabi, United Arab, Arab Emirates, Haifa, Israel, and the whole time I was always an American, and I was always uh, protected then by the flag, my unit, and I never stopped being faithful to America, and that, that's, again, something that you can't take away from us. As deported U.S. veterans, we feel that um, we should have been protected by the country that we were willing to, to fight and die for. Of course, uh, it, it is very painful to be deported after serving the country. Um, my kids, my kids need me. Um, my kids have been waiting for me ever ever since uh, I, I got in trouble. Um, they were waiting for me. I was supposed to be released in, in a year and a half, and I never made it back to them. I got in trouble in 2008 uh, for marijuana. I was sentenced to 37 months in, in the federal prison, and the judge recommended me the drug program and halfway house which would have given me about a year and a half off of my time. I was sent to a federal prison camp uh, with no fences, no, no walls. And um, after about three months uh, of being at the federal prison camp, the uh, immigration flag popped up. And uh, then I was sent to the hole for three months and then transferred to a medium prison where they have an actual razor wire, um, armed guards, and, and a, a lot more uh, serious uh, inmates. And I, I also lost my drug program and I lost my halfway house. So I had to do uh, all, all my time. My kids were, were waiting for me and, and I never made it back home. After being deported, I, I was sent through, uh, through TJ all the way uh, on the bus on the way uh, from prison, I kept thinking that something might happen, like uh, that they would stop the bus and, and stop the bus and somebody would, would get on and say, you know, we're not gonna deport this guy because he's a US veteran or something would happen and it never did. Um, I did get deported. I was sent to Nogales. Nogales is not a nice place. Not, it's not a good place. They're not very accepting of outsiders there. I only lasted about six months in Nogales. Uh, once people found out that I was a, a U.S. military veteran, strange people started coming around the house asking them if I knew how to work with weapons, if I knew how to shoot people, and you know, all kinds of strange people started coming around, and uh, I, I didn't want anything to do with them. So I, I ended up leaving Nogales and coming to a, a town called Rosarito, or it would, it's much more accepting of, of Americans. I got four kids in the U.S. Uh, they miss me and they need me. Um, I'm not the I'm not the only one that, that's going through this. I can only uh, speak for myself, but I, I can say that you know, with all the deportations going on, and with the way that my kids feel right now, it, it's a uh, it's a country that that's that's growing up with a, a bunch of kids that are missing one or two parents. And they're going. They're going to grow up, and they're not. They're not going to. They're not going to like the government that did this to them. I don't think they're going to grow up with this pain. They're going to grow up with this anger. As U.S. veterans, of course, I feel that we should be allowed to to be home in the country that that we were willing to to fight fight for and, and kill for and die for. Uh, we deserve to be back home with our families. I think that uh, America uh, is a country that says over and over it's like our national motto is, is to support the troops uh honor honor the veterans honor the soldiers um so if if we say support the troops so much then why do we deport the troops why uh why was i uh good enough to to fight and die for america but i'm not good enough to live there uh, we don't feel that that's right I think America has gotten its its use out of me. I've done my time in America. I've done my time in the public uh, school system. I've done my time in the military. 
I've done my time in the federal prison system. So America has very, very, very well got their use out of me, used me thoroughly. And I was happy to oblige, but now I want to be home. I'm tired of being away from home. I'm, ti I'm tired of being ex exiled. I just want to go home. That's it. I just want to go home. in English para la introducción. Um, I'm just supposed to introduce um, the team and say a couple of things. Um, I wanted to thank Berkeley Center for New Media and DH at Berkeley. Both Lara and Claudia are here. They helped with the logistical coordination and also the Spanish and Portuguese Department and the Center for Latin American Studies um, is supporting this event and the Chicano Latino Student Development Office. Um, and I wanted to thank Yvonne and Carlos Macia Prieto from the Spanish and Portuguese department because they also helped a lot in the organization of the event or putting it together. And then we have here today with us Guillermo Alonso Meneses, who's a professor in the Department of Cultural Studies in the Colegio de la Frontera Norte, and is one of the principal investigators of the project. And Robert Irwin, who's also a principal investigator, and he's a uh, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the Cultural Studies program um, in UC Davis. And so I think the format that the presentation is going to follow is that the research team is going to present on several aspects of the project for about 40 to 50 minutes, and then we're going to open um, a conversation up with the public. And thanks to everyone for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Yaira. Um, so welcome to uh, this presentation about the project Humanizando la Deportación, Humanizing Deportation. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for us to be here, and thanks to everyone that, that Yaira thanked. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce a, a few aspects of uh, this project so you can understand what it's about and how we did it. Uh, and then some other members of the team are going to uh, present some other aspects of it. The, the project arose about a year ago. Uh, or a year, yeah, a year, no, a year and a half ago, sorry, <clears throat> during the presidential primary elections. Um, and I was dialoguing at one point with Guillermo uh, about concerns that I had that seemed to uh, uh, coincide with some that he had from the perspective of Mexico around the theme of deportation. There's a lot of discourse about deportation, uh, even very early in the electoral campaign in the U.S., but also in, in Tijuana at that time, with a lot of deport people who were being deported arriving there, uh, which had to do with both um, <coughs> who uh, was being deported, what is, what is a deported person, what is that person like, uh, and most people that I felt who were talking about deportation really had no idea who most of those people were. Um, there's the archetype of the bad hombre that came out later in the electro electoral season, um, but that, uh, I, that archetype or stereotype didn't... Uh, <clears throat> reflect the complexity of what uh, the actual public population of deported people is like. In Mexico, uh, deported people are often stigmatized. Uh, there's an idea that the U.S. is just like opening the prisons and busing everyone across the border. Uh, and so there's an idea that deported people are criminals, inherently criminals. Uh, also, there was a lot of sensationalist press about um, homeless populations of deported people who were uh, drug addicts uh, that came out in different news reports. And so there's an idea that a lot of uh, deportees are uh, drug addicts also. Um, and then there's also a, a lack of knowledge. People have a lot of opinions about deportation without understanding what that really means, what the process of deportation is like, what the experience is like for, uh, at, the, at the level of, the, of being lived by individuals. And so in the United States, we have uh, mass involuntary <laughs> displacement of, of people going on for many years, and people have a lot of opinions about it, but have no idea, uh, in, in most cases, what that means. Uh, and in Mexico, this lack of knowledge uh, is, has, has factors um, that uh, make it, <coughs> uh, the, the services that are offered are inadequate uh, to those who are arriving there, and often there are 
there's almost nothing that is being offered to people who are arriving there. So this is what got, got us concerned about this and wanting us, and, and got us wanting to do some kind of a project that would allow us to communicate what the actual experience of deportation is like and what people are like who have gone through it. Um, it's a project that we got financed by UC Mexis. It's a collaborative project that's also financed by CONACYT, the um, Mexico's National Council of Science and Technology. And our research team, uh, as you can see, covers a range of universities. Uh, a lot of us are here today. Uh, Annalisa Calvillo of the Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua, Lisbeth de la Cruz of Davis, Sarah Hart uh, of Davis, Jose uh, Israel Ibarra of uh, Corte de Mexico, Dorte Krebsbach, who we met in Tijuana, but is from the Free University of Berlin, uh, Marlene, Marlene Mercado from UC Davis, uh, Jessica is not here today, Gaira from UC Berkeley, uh, Marinka and Danai are not here, and some people who didn't go to Tijuana, which is where we did most of our work, but who have been supporting us in different ways, John Guzman from UC Davis, uh, Rigo Nava, UC Davis, uh, Another UC Berkeley undergrad, Antonio Solorio, who was going to come. I don't think he's arrived. But we did most of our uh, work, almost all of it, in Tijuana. We spent a month there this past summer. Um, Tijuana, if you don't know, is a major site uh, historically of transmigration, of people passing from other parts of Mexico or from Central America or South America, uh, passing through with the idea of coming to, to the north. And there's lots of kind of infrastructure in Tijuana that was created to uh, accommodate in different ways uh, migrants. The movement nowadays is in the other direction with people arriving daily to Tijuana, um, return migrants, deportees. Um, and so there has also been a formation of exile communities, basically, of people who were migrants, uh, I'm calling them here ex-migrants, uh, who don't think of themselves necessarily as migrants, people who were deeply rooted in the U.S. and rather than going back to places that they don't know uh, in other parts of Mexico, um, stay right there at the border to be close to their families, uh, to be close to the U.S., which is a, a country that they identify with. So these are communities of trauma. We've created an archive. Uh, when I made this slide, there were 43, not 41. We've got 43 stories on our website now. It's a public bilingual uh, archive that you all can use for whatever applications you want. We're hoping to get word out so that people can make use of it. Um, uh, Israel was telling us he presented this at a conference uh, in, in Tijuana a couple of weeks ago of lawyers who might uh, who were, were seeing the usefulness of this archive to argue for make arguments for asylum cases, for example. But we thought about. Uh, community activism. We worked with some groups. Uh, Alex was, was, was one of two, uh, a member of one of two veterans, deported veterans groups. There are a lot of deported veterans uh, in the world. Um, and anyway, they, they use, they can use these videos for their activism. Las Madres Soñadoras, we worked a lot with them in Tijuana as well. Uh, we're hoping to be able to do a lot of community education on university campuses or elsewhere. Um, and also this is on the web, and so the extent at which it gets uh, disseminated uh, allows people to find out, learn things, uh, see things. Uh, classroom education, these are uh, five-minute videos, more or less, that we've produced, so it's, and they're bilingual, they're easy to use in, in a range of different kinds of classes. We've also got an archive with over 40 stories that can be used for research, uh, and we're going to be expanding in the future. We've got new partnerships that we're trying to uh, uh, solidified, but it looks like they're going to happen to, to allow us to work in Guadalajara, Mexico City, Oaxaca, uh, other places, and with some different community organizations. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn the, the uh, what do you call it? I'm going to dar la palabra to uh, Liz de la Cruz, who's going to tell us a bit about the methodology we use for this project, Digital Storytelling. Okay. Okay, so I'll do this part in English, but if you do have questions in Spanish, you can always ask during the section of questions. So the method uh, is digital storytelling. So basically what it consists of is of participants willing to speak out and basically voice out their stories. And a lot of these um, stories are appearing or coming out from the urgency to say um, what's going on with your life, maybe a story that might not be visible in social media or by like media itself. So a lot of these participants feel like they need a space in which they could actually 
um, speak about their, um, for example, with our project Humaniza la Deportación, about the deportation stories. Um, most of these participants, um, we were able to encounter them in field work. So a lot of us had the opportunity to actually just, you know, wander around Tijuana and also Playas de Tijuana and find different people who wanted to speak out. So having that relationship with people in the community was very helpful. We also had the opportunity to have like different groups in Tijuana that would offer their space. And for example, Las Madres Soñadoras and the Porter Veterans, like the bunker, uh, provided the space for us to just meet participants or potential participants, or maybe they would refer us to someone else. So having this opportunity um, made it easier for us to use the methodology and basically modify it just to make sure we know how to use it in this type of field because the method could be applied for different um, communities, but in relation to uh, the deported folks, we have to kind of adapt it to their needs and their capacity in being able to participate for themselves. So here we have like different points, but some of the most important ones, it's to emphasize that it's a do-it-yourself type of video. So it doesn't have to be super fancy or high tech. All we need is like maybe like your cell phone or like an audio recorder that might be able to be um, just like the basic things like record, um, delete, and stop, um, I would say are like the most important ones. So you could just have like the participant, um, maybe like during the first meeting, debrief a little bit more on what they would want to share. Uh, sometimes, and I think it's like something we all kind of faced in our encounter with Tijuana, was that the first meeting was more for the participants to tell you what they lived through. So it was like a very emotional experience just sitting there and like hearing them out. Sometimes. It was hard not to feel for them or like not to cry with them with their stories, but um, you kind of have to kind of like move away from that to actually work on their story. So the second time you would meet with them, for example, you would brainstorm on what they should focus on and then you would record. So a lot of the times um, you would encourage them to write out their narrative, but sometimes they couldn't do that. So you would just kind of have to like record and then edit out parts that they would want to include in their audio. So I think that's one of the most important parts, just the recording process for the digital storytelling. Um, the second one would be to select images or small clips that would enhance their audio. So what I would always tell them is that, for example, if they wanted to keep their stories private, to basically uh, let us know ahead of time, and then we would blur out their pictures, especially if they're using family members, so we don't want to like, basically give out who they are you know, or make it too visible. So that's an option they have. Some people, like you saw in Alex's video, he wants to show his face because he's very public about his story. But there's other people, for example, in one of the Madres Soñadoras, she didn't want anyone to know who she was. So you would have to accommodate your method to what they need. So for example, in Sofia's story, she's in the archive, um, I, would, I had to go in playas and take pictures of random people. So I picked a family, asked them if I could take pictures of them in the beach that would kind of reflect her story. So things like that, just kind of be creative with like what you could work with for the situation. Um, one of the other important parts is that the narrative should be brief. So two to five minutes, sometimes we do make an exception. We do do like two or three sessions. I know for one of your participants, Sara, you guys did like a three section video. Um, and I know it was, it was like you were part of that too. So it just depends on the story. Um, we have to kind of cater to the participant in that fact. So we're just there as facilitators, um, helping them basically get their story out there. And another thing, because it is internet friendly, we have to use small files. So it just can't be an elaborated video. But at the same time, that offers opportunity for other people in different countries to have like easy access to the website. So we do host our videos through YouTube, just to make that a little bit easier. And I know Yaira was the one who came up with that idea, just to kind of save that. Um, the space we had in our archive and just kind of open it up to YouTube, which is another outlet for communication and visibility as well. Um, so yeah, we didn't we didn't have an agenda going in. We just went into the field to basically collect what was there. So it's a reality. So we didn't have uh, like something um, predetermined, but we did have an interest on certain um, communities. For example, I work with like dreamers or dreamer moms, so I would focus on that community. But Overall, it was just kind of seeing what was available in this space in Tijuana. Um, so it's open access by Lingua. As you saw, we do have transcriptions. So Rigo was part of that as well in translating from English or Spanish and then adding on the transcription. So we would use things like um, iMovie or anything that's available for us for um, editing. 
So it's not like a huge complex process, but it does take time in elaborating and making sure um, we are meeting like the participants' expectations, especially for groups like the deported, deported veterans, which they would want to use these videos for um, their activism. So we would kind of have to see what helps each different participant and just kind of like mold the method and something that would help them. So if you have questions, you could ask me later, but I'll continue for the next participant. Thanks. Yeah, and so digital storytelling is something that has its roots here in Berkeley. But there's a place called the Story Center that is are the ones who have a book about this, and so we based our method on theirs. But the, the basic idea is that this is not us making a documentary film or doing ethnography. This is people who want to tell stories publicly, and we're giving them a platform. We're using technology that they can manage themselves, and so that they finish being the authors of the stories. We're not the authors of the stories. We're the facilitators of the stories. This is why there's no pre preconceived agenda. We may have an agenda. But this, this archive doesn't reflect our agenda, it reflects the, the agenda of the collective agenda of the people that we worked with in Tijuana. So let's, let's watch another story. Mi nombre es Elizabeth Estrada. Eh, decidí eh, irme para Estados Unidos en el, en el año 96. Este, mis hijos estaban chicos, tuve, tengo dos niños, eh, uno de 18 meses y la otra de 4 años. Y pues para que tuvieran una mejor vida decidí irnos, mi esposo se fue primero y yo después. Primero pasaron mis hijos para asegurarme que, que estuvieran bien, pasaran bien. Eh, me esperé hasta que mi, lo recibiera mi esposo y ya después yo, yo, yo pasé. Gracias a Dios, pues no, no, no hubo ningún problema. Este, pasé bien. Y hicimos una familia, una, un, pues una vida allá. Este, pues mis hijos estudiaron. Una de ellas este, eh, terminó la universidad. Y, este, y pues mi hijo ahí va. Ay. Espero que este espero que recapacite y, y, y tengo la esperanza de que él, o sea, eh, decida estudi este, seguir estudiando para que él tenga una mejor vida y un, un mejor futuro como una vez este su papá les dijo que, que él este venimos aquí en este país porque él no, no, no trajo este, burros a, a trabajar, porque así les decía. Eh, trabajar en warehouse no es una cosa mala, es una cosa decente, pero este, uno de padre este, prefiere lo, lo mejor, quiere lo mejor de, de, de los hijos. Entonces, como él dijo, pues para burros estamos nosotros, entonces él, ellos tenían que superar, su, superarnos y... Y, y estudiar y ser alguien en la vida para que valiera la pena el sacrificio que, que nosotros hicimos eh, sacrificando nuestras costumbres y nuestras familias, dejando nuestra, nuestras familias pues desgraciadamente lo, lo volvió a agarrar este, la policía y... antes de eso, él ya había ido a ver al, a la abogada y, este, y él fue, ella fue la que arregló lo de Sudaca y pues le dijo que ella ahorita no estaba enfocada en eso, que no estaba enfocada en eso, que estaba enfocada en otras cosas, que, que por eso se hubiera portado bien, sí, le dijo así, y dice, y pues le voy a dar su expediente, dice allá, pues no sé quién vaya a querer este, eh, agarrar su caso, y entonces eh, mi esposo le dijo, es que mi hijo, él tiene miedo, él no quiere, yo, y nosotros también tenemos miedo porque hemos escuchado muchas historias de, de México, no, no, de México. cosas este lo que pasaba entonces ella le dijo que pues que se que rezara que se pusiera a rezar y a pedirle a Dios y que se portara bien y entonces le, le entregó su expediente a que le entregó su expediente y o sea ella no quiso saber nada del ah, caso no. pero uno como padre a veces este eh, no tiene el corazón así como para como para pues este dejarlo no Sí. Pues cuando nos enteramos de, de, este, de que lo, lo habían asaltado y eso, y luego no sabíamos nada de él, entonces sabiendo cómo está aquí, aquí pues esta ciudad y, y los policías como son, 
de, de, yo decidí venir. De hecho, nosotros ya, ya pensábamos este, regresarnos para de donde somos, del estado de donde somos, nada más que nos adelantamos un poquito. Que él quiere regresarse, él está en eso de regresarse. Pues, eh, o sea, si es su decisión, pues sí, o sea, siempre y cuando también haga las cosas bien y, 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 se, y trate de, de hacerlas bien, porque no tiene caso que se regrese si, si va, a ser, va a estar en las mismas y, y de qué sirve que se vaya si va a terminar otra vez en la cárcel o qué sé yo, ¿verdad? Al pesar hay muchos peligros, sí hay muchos peligros y, y, y pues... Eh, si pasa bien, que bueno, pero en dado caso de que le vaya a pasar algo o otra cosa, de que lo vaya a agarrar migración, le va a, le va, lo va a meter por, no sé, varios años, porque ya, ya este, pues está deportado y luego, entonces tiene que, que darle tiempo al tiempo. Para, y también hay muchas opciones, puede irse a Canadá, mira, o sea, él... Él puede irse a otro a otro lugar, o sea, no es necesario, pues ahí porque la verdad, si ese señor sigue, no sé, este, de hecho, en dado caso que les quiera dar documentos a, a, a las personas, ya no va a ser lo mismo, porque tengo entendido que les va a quitar muchos, muchos beneficios. Y entonces, eh, como yo le he dicho a él, ¿para qué quieres estar en un país donde no te quieren? We're going to continue with a, a little presentation from uh, Ana Luisa Calvillo. Well, I'm going to read a few notes, uh, quick notes, about the challenges that we faced uh, during the process. And uh, we're seeing right there a picture of the shelter of La Roca del Alfarero in Tijuana, Mexico. One of the biggest challenges faced by the research team was getting the attention and commitment of the people who was called, both those who were getting to know the project and those who had already confirmed their participation months er earlier. In the if the central purpose of this methodology is that the voice of silent communities be positioned in the public discourse The, pro the problem of not having many of the participants representing a critical situation. We might think that this is because many of them uh, don't have a fixed address or a cell phone because it is a marginalized population. However, I believe that this problem, this problem rather highlights a, a much more complex reality. On the one hand, They lived a violent expulsion with deportation and went through a detention center. On the other hand, when they arrived to Mexico, they faced extortion and abuse of the police, which, as several researchers have pointed out, is the main predator of migrants. This adds to other violence, such as the stigma of failure because being, of being deported, and the social stigma of being homeless in the absence of, absence of economic resources and social networks that help them to accommodate themselves uh, with dignity in a new physical space. If we add to this the abandonment of state institutions and the pandemic of addictions, we have a critical set of vulnerabilities that increase social distrust and prevent the construction of a sense of belonging. From my point of view, it is this distrust that motivates people to take non-location and anonymity as a survival strategy. Given these circumstances, the team had to deploy a series of personal and group strategies to achieve a positive interaction with the participants, uh, like greater, greater tolerance and understanding of social conditions, a reflective and empathetic listening with those who needed to bend before constructing, constructing their narrative and sharing the public or private space where they felt more secure to express themselves. 
Each one of us had to negotiate the way of collaboration preferred by the participants, assuming the humanizing character of this project and trying to understand. Yo tengo una historia que a mí me pasó que yo tengo un amigo, un amigo aquí de todos, aquí el, el desayunador del padre Chava, era un señor fortunato, nosotros le decíamos el apá, porque él se la pasaba en el centro pidiendo dinero, a todos le decía, apá, préstame un peso, apá, dame un peso, porque él tenía un problema, él era un alcohólico. Y muy, muy, muy bien, muy, se portaba muy bien él con todo el mundo. Una vez yo saliendo a trabajar, me dijo un amigo, hey, supiste que se murió el APA? Ah, dije, ¿a poco? Sí. Pues todo ese día estuve pensando en eso, y dije, ah, sí, es de las cosas. Y todo, el siguiente día me levanté temprano y me preocupó, me preocupé por él, dije, yo voy a... A, le avisarían a sus familiares. De hecho, fui al lugar, un albergue donde él, donde él vive ya, y les pregunté que si les habían avisado a los familiares. Me dijeron que no, que pues a dónde y cómo. Es que aquí la policía cuando los agarra uno les quita sus papeles, se los tiran y, y así se la pasan ellos. Uh, quitándoles dinero y todo eso porque no traen ningún documento. Empecé a investigar, a preguntar a los amigos que si él tenía familia, a dónde, a dónde poderles avisar, ¿verdad?, que, que lo que había pasado a él. Y no, entonces me acordé del, del diseñador ahí con la madre Margarita, que ahí nos dejan hacer llamadas para el otro lado, ellos apuntan en un cuaderno a quién le vas a hablar y con quién quieres hablar y el número de teléfono. Y ellos lo guardan. Entonces me acordé de ella y fui, hablé con la hermana Margarita y le expliqué lo que había pasado. Y me dijo ella, sí, y ya le dije yo que lo tenían en la, en la fosa, que lo iban a echar en la fosa si no lo reclamaban los familiares. Entonces... La señora Margarita me dijo que la acompañara allá. Entró ella y regresó, salió muy triste y me dijo ella que sí, que sí era él. De hecho, regresamos al desayunador y empezamos a buscar en un cuaderno a ver si él había hecho una llamada. Encontramos que ella, él hizo una llamada unos dos años atrás. Habló con una hermana que él tiene allá en el otro lado. Encontramos ese número y la madre Margarita habló con su hermana y le explicó lo que había pasado. De hecho, la hermana vino el siguiente día, como a las 5 de la mañana ya estaban aquí afuera del desayunador. Me siento bien porque gracias a esa llamada que yo y la hermana Margarita, la madre Margarita hicimos, vino su familia y se lo llevaron a un lugar donde lo iban a enterrar. Pero me quedo yo con preocupado mucho porque pues yo también soy deportado y muchos albergues no tienen información de nosotros, como un número de teléfono en caso de una emergencia. Yo a veces me pongo a pensar y digo, si a mí me pasa algo, ¿qué pasaría conmigo? Me gustaría que todos los albergues tuvieran un teléfono en caso de una emergencia y así podríamos estar más a gusto que la familia viniera por nosotros. Okay, we're going to continue with uh, Sarah Hart. Con la pantalla. Uh, la Hola, buenas tardes. Voy a hablar inglés también. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ethical questions of applying our digital storytelling methodology from my particular perspective. So as you can all see, our archive includes many diverse perspectives on human experiences of deportation because we engage with participants in a range of different situations, um, who we reach through shelters, support services, employers, community organizations and organizers, activist groups, and family networks. 
Um, so we had to adapt, as we've already heard, our digital storytelling methodology to the needs of each individual. Um, the basic premise, as Liz explained, is to compile a narrated audio track accompanied by a slideshow of photos. And ideally, the participants would be the editors, creators of their videos. But in practice, really the level of hands-on input depended on the participants' familiarity um, with and access to digital media, as well as the varying levels of precariousness of their living conditions. Um, so as Liz already explained, we started by getting to know each person we worked with, um, asking them what message they wanted to express and to who. So some wanted to write their thoughts down, and others preferred just speaking ad lib into a microphone, which comes out sounding more natural, but actually requires a lot more extensive editing on our part. Um, in some cases, we were able to do photo shoots with participants, but, uh, and then in other cases, people provided us with images that they had on their Facebook um, or on cameras or phones, but many times they just trusted us to select and edit the images for them. Um, so, though we always made sure that participants approved the final version of their videos, I wonder how their sense of ownership or their senses of ownership were affected by these adaptations to the method, um, which we are continuing to think through in terms of our inevitable influence as facilitators. Um, and this I see as part of our continuing reflexive praxis. So my learning curve was huge. Um, I'm from a background in socially engaged performance. Uh, I facilitate community projects um, using theater, mostly in England and Chile in the past. Um, so this work that we were doing in Tijuana was essentially based in one-on-one -on -one dialogue with participants. Um, it involved negotiating, for me, the line between personal and professional relationships, which came out to be very complex in my experience. Um, I found myself wondering what people's expectations were of our collaboration and whether we could really meet them. Um, could any of us know the possible consequences or benefits of sharing these stories ahead of time? Um, I was constantly aware of my own inability to respond to participants' most pressing needs. Wouldn't it be more useful to help someone living on the street find a place to sleep? But that's not what I was there to do. Um, I was even concerned at times about my own well-being, since we were a group of mostly women in male-dominated public and peripheral spaces. How much could I share with myself about participants? There was no rule book. Um, we were not necessarily equipped ahead of time to unpack all the traumas that came out of, as part of this process. Um, so I could only try not to repeat the trope of parachuting in and taking people's stories and leaving, right? Um, and at the same time, trying to be very open about acknowledging the fact that I could not commit to a long-term sustained interaction since my stay in Tijuana was limited. So then I'm left with the question, what is it that we could do together? What I have come away with is the value of making time and space for human connection and care, however seemingly small, um, as a form of resistance to the systemic criminalization and racialization of certain migrant bodies who were always already unwelcomed in the discourse of the nation state, invisibilized by regimes of enclosure that deny their citizenship rights. Yet, as many people have told us, the wall may separate families, but it can never stop sentiments. For me, the crux of this project lies in interactions with people who have experiences of deportation and who find ways not only of surviving and overcoming obstacles, but of uplifting themselves and each other through networks of care and communication. We became part of these complex clandestine relationalities as the basis of our digital storytelling approach, whether or not we fully understand our participation yet. Um, is it as simple as just starting a conversation with the potential to affect positive change? I felt most confident about the positive impact of the videos I worked on with two women who've made new lives for themselves in Tijuana, Esther and Juana. Um, and they're both role models, entrepreneurs, activists, and leaders in their communities. Esther, um, whose video is called Tireless Warrior, which we're about to watch, has a clear inspirational message for others who've been deported, um, as well as US citizens about the injustices of our system. She's interested in disseminating her story to a wider audience, and we can help amplify her voice. So before coming here today, I asked her if there was anything that she would like to say to the audience here at UC Berkeley. So Esther has a message for you. The best therapy for any pain is work. Solitude is not bad because it lets you find yourself and brings you peace. 
I go to the movies alone, I go walking alone, and I feel really, really good. I have many friends, but I like my solitude. It makes me feel important and different than the rest. This is a message for any young person who's ever felt lonely. She said to this to me in Spanish, and I have translated it. Um, so she also has a question for you. Why is it that there is in the US, no, why is it that over there in the US, which is a rich and powerful country, there are poor homeless people in the streets? What is the problem? So I have here cards and pens, and I'd like to invite all of you to write a response to Esther's question and put it into one of these envelopes while we watch her video. I'm going to pass them around, and we're going to send these to her in Tijuana so that she can see your responses to her question. Should we start the video? Yeah. This is actually the third part of a three-part video that Esther did with us. And so I encourage you to go to our website and watch. Después de deportaciones y procesos de años de vivir en Estados Unidos, en el mes de septiembre del 2010, fue que fue mi última deportación, y se estaban celebrando las fallestas patrias. Es viva México y las banderas y todo eso. Eh, aunque ya había estado en Tijuana, eh, no lo conocía bien bien. Pregunté, oye, ¿por dónde está la casa Madre Asunta? Y ya me dije, no, está como a dos callecitas para allá abajo. Pues llegué muy cansada y me mandaron a un dormitorio. Entonces al otro día, pues el albergue es deprimente porque hay muchísimas mujeres. Y pues si trae una tristeza, pues ese ambiente no, no, no es agradable. Entonces lo que yo hice fue que me levanté, desayuné y me salí. Entonces pues, pues me fui a caminar y recordé y bajé para abajo donde yo conocía de Tijuana. Caminando vi un letrero que decía se solicita trabajadora y, y la puerta estaba abierta y me metí en un edificio antiguo. Una señora de 90 y como de 92 años por ahí. Me dijo, oye, ando buscando una trabajadora, se me fue mi trabajadora. Y le dije, no, pues yo ando buscando trabajo. Oh, ¿puedes trabajar aquí? Sí, le dije. La señora vivía sola, era rica, muy rica, dueña de apartamentos. Y me dijo que me podía quedar a vivir ahí. Y así comencé a, a trabajar, a guardar un poco de dinero, pero como la señora estaba bastante grande, solo tuve ese trabajo por nueve meses, porque la señora se enfermó y, y se murió. Pues empecé a buscar trabajo, empecé a caminar, caminar otra vez. Y fue que eh, pasé por el centro de una tortillería que se llama La Mexicana. Y ahí había un anuncio bastante grande que decía, se solicita a una mujer que haga sabrosísimos tamales. Y pues me le quedé viendo al anuncio, pero en mi vida había hecho tamales. ¿no? Y me dijeron que ahí estaba el dueño ahí atrás, que le fuera a hablar a él. Es el dueño de todo ese edificio, de toda la calle. Entonces me dice, oh, dice, mira, el negocio no va a ser aquí. Dice, aquí no se van a hacer tamales, se van a hacer ahí enfrente. Dijo, vamos. Entonces cuando alzó la cortina y vi los murales, yo dije, pero ¿por qué tiene usted estos murales en esta basura? Y entonces dijo, pues aquí va a ser la tamalería que yo quiero poner. Le dije, pues sí. Me dijo, bueno, ¿qué? ya me tengo que ir, dijo, te voy a dejar la llave. Entonces yo me duró dos meses limpiar ese lugar. Pero en el tiempo que el señor me dejó eh, limpiando el lugar y se fue, yo investigué cómo se hacían los tamales de lote. Entonces este, yo sí tuve problemas con eso porque una vez tiré 80 de que no me quedaban, no me quedaban, no me quedaban, pues en mi vida había hecho tamales. ¿eh? Y me vinieron quedando ya bien, 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 como al año. Como les digo, es una ironía, ¿no?, de la vida, de que ahora eh, mis clientas sean todas de Estados Unidos y que se llevan el tamal, que dicen que está delicioso, que se lo llevan por docenas, el tamal se va a Estados Unidos. Lo que me eh, hacía a veces a mí eh, deprimirme y todo, pues siempre era el recuerdo de mi hija. Mi soledad me llevó a buscar amigos en lugares equivocados, como son los bares. Como que pensaba que sé pues, qué valía el éxito, ¿no? Así, o, o me deprimía. Y fue que comencé con problemas con el alcohol. 
en, cuando estaba sí que estaba mal, que no podía trabajar, obviamente si había tomado mucho a otro ya no me levantaba. Entonces un día me levanté a comprar algo de comer y vi el negocio cerrado. No sé, me dolió mucho, me sentí más triste. Entonces me bañé y me puse bien y esa hora fui y abrí. La mejor terapia es el trabajo, ante cualquier situación. Y me he dedicado a ese, tra a ese negocio, a cuerpo y alma. Entonces mi mensaje ahora es, para toda la gente que que vive en Tijuana, que tuvo la desdicha de ser deportado, que, que, que la vida no se acabó y el lugar no es las calles, las barras, eso no merece, ¿sí? porque somos seres humanos, merecemos vivir dignamente, que no necesariamente tienen que ir a Estados Unidos para triunfar, yo triunfé aquí en mi propio país, en Tijuana. A, ahora Lisa... Ella es una joven de 23 años, está preparada, está también sobre el éxito. Es una excelente enfermera de Beverly Hills, en un hospital canino. Está terminando su carrera y yo entiendo su trabajo, porque yo viví en Estados Unidos y sé cómo se vive allá. Sé que mi hija está aquí en mi corazón conmigo. Estamos juntas porque el amor nunca lo va a destruir nada. El amor no lo divide en una barda, un muro. El amor está aquí entre tú y yo. Y hoy más fuerte que nunca. So we're going to conclude with just one more video. Um, this takes us back just about a year ago, uh, right after the election. Uh, we had scheduled our training uh, for this project on how to do digital storytelling, how to follow our research protocols in Tijuana. And so we ended up in Tijuana uh, right after the election, all of us very shaken by the election and with the need to understand what was going on there. And so we, we went we went to the, the desayunador, the Padre Chava that you saw there, uh, where they offer over a thousand uh, breakfasts every morning to all comers, uh, indigents living in the area. It's, it's located about a half a block from the border. Um, we went there and volunteered, and like leaving there, we met this guy on the street. We wanted to see El Bordo, which is the canal that's right on the border, right near the, the crossing point where there had been uh, some homeless camps uh, where a lot of deport deported people were living. So we wanted to see that. They had been kind of cleaned out of there at that time. Uh, but we went met this guy on the street, and he offered to take us there. And so we all went uh, and toured El Bordo. We are right at the border of this yellow line. That's the border between Mexico and the US. We didn't cross that line that day. Um, and uh, he became uh, kind of a, he, he ended up doing the, the very first video that we did. Uh, and he later introduced us to some other people that were like him, uh, kind of indigent, semi-indigent people. That, those were the kind of hardest spaces for us to penetrate uh, because they were often kind of dangerous spaces. They were, they were spaces of people who were not likely to trust us. Um, and so like, I was able to form a kind of a friendship with him, uh, and he was someone who helped us. To me, he was a kind of a muse uh, for this project as we were uh, carrying it out this summer in Tijuana. So I want to show you his video, and we're gonna, just going to conclude with that. Uh, Crueles Deportaciones. Mi nombre es Gerardo. Voy a relatarles lo que ha sido mi deportación. Fui, fui deportado a la ciudad de Tijuana. Viví 12 años en Estados Unidos. En esos 12 años conocí a mi esposa, con la cual tuve dos hijas. Esas dos hijas que pues quedaron sin padre. Les voy a comentarse de lo que son mis hijas, pues ellas están chicas y aún extrañan a su papá de que no está con ellas. En esos 12 años tuve un tropiezo en el cual me detuvieron por andar tomando pues borracho. Ese tropiezo me llevó a que si yo pensaba arreglar papeles en el futuro, pues ya no lo puedo hacer por ese motivo. El momento de mi redada fue cuando estaba trabajando. 
Este, llegaron ellos y un agente de inmigración dijo, ahora sí se van a ir a comer nopales y frijoles a su México querido, dijo. En ese momento nos llevaron a una cárcel, una cárcel pues de la misma migración. Son lugares que por afuera se mira que están muy bonitos, pero por dentro se vive la realidad. Como 40 personas en un, se dicen tanques, son como celdas, que no hay camas, no tienen un baño. Como les digo, no hay camas, se tienen que dormir en el piso y a veces encimados, porque es tanta gente que meten en una sola celda que no cabe, no cabe la gente. En, en esa celda, en esas este, detenciones, te quieren tener este, amarrado las 24 horas, te quieren tener esposado, sales al doctor, vas esposado, sales a, al baño, vas este, esposado. El trato que te dan los agentes de inmigración adentro de una cárcel es que abusan de la persona cuando no les entiendes su, su idioma a ellos, te dicen cosas que son ofensivas para ti. Te maltratan física y moralmente también. Si te lastimas mucho, no puedes hablar con nadie, con un abogado, no puedes hablar con, con tu familia para decirle lo que estás viviendo adentro. Cuando me deportaron a México, pues no tenía a nadie aquí en, en Tijuana, que es donde estoy viviendo ahorita en estos momentos. Los primeros días fueron estresantes para mí porque pues no tenía nadie, no tenía un techo, no tenía una cama, no tenía alimentos para poder este, comer, así de que tuve que vivir en las calles. También no, no podía comunicarme con mi familia porque pues no, no tenía los números de teléfono que necesitaba para hablar con ellos, hasta que pude ir al lugar donde se encuentran mis padres y, y obtener los números de teléfono para comunicarme con mi familia. Mientras eso pasó, estuve viviendo momentos que en realidad para mí fueron muy, muy malos, en los cuales tuve que pedir ayuda a mucha gente. Ahorita, ahorita en este momento estoy viviendo momentos que todavía no los no logro asimilar, no, no, no logro este, comprenderlos bien aún, que estoy aquí y, y aún estoy solo, aunque viene mi familia de Estados Unidos a, vez, a verme, pues no, no me siento completamente bien realizado porque pues el vivir solo aquí en México, en un lugar donde nadie te conoce, que tienes que buscar el pan de cada día todos los días, porque no tienes un lugar fijo donde vivir, que no tienes este, a tu familia, que tú les puedes echar la mano a ellos y te puedes echar la mano a ti. Eso no es vivir, esto no es vivir aquí, lo que estoy viviendo. Después de todo esto, he buscado la manera de, de volver a cruzar Estados Unidos, pero no he podido. Traté de cruzar como cuatro o cinco veces. La primera vez quise cruzarme por el desierto, traté de cruzar por Arizona, ya casi llegaba a una ciudad que se llama Tucson y me arrestaron, me volvieron a deportar. Me vienen para Tijuana y aquí en Tijuana quise cruzar por un lugar que se llama El Nido de las Águilas. Por ahí también fracasé dos veces. Después quise cruzar por playas de Tijuana también. Ahí mismo también me, me detuvieron. Faltaba mucho para llegar a, una, a San Diego y me detuvieron y fui deportado nuevamente a Tijuana. Después, por última vez, quise cruzar pegadito a la línea, ahí por donde entra toda la gente. Y me, me detuvieron, me deportaron, pero esa vez me llevaron con un juez de migración, el cual me dijo que si volví a intentar cruzar y me detenían, me dijo que me iba a dar hasta 30 meses de cárcel, por el cual motivo ya no, no quiero volver a cruzar. Les voy a platicar sobre de lo que ha sido los asuntos personales con mi familia. Pues al momento que me deportaron, como les platicaba anteriormente, duré como un mes para poder obtener comunicación con mi esposa y mis hijas. Ya después de eso, mi familia viene cada mes, cada dos meses, pues ellos se sienten tranquilos y a la vez también yo, aunque no completamente feliz porque pues no estoy con ellos para siempre. Yo quisiera estar con ellos siempre. No puedo por los motivos de que pues una línea, una línea divisoria nos divide. En realidad, este... Pues este mensaje que les manda a todo, a, a todo el mundo es para que sepan que las deportaciones que están haciendo pues es una cosa muy desagradable porque están, están rompiendo relaciones, están rompiendo familias, están haciendo pedazos a muchos sentimientos hacia la persona que es deportada. Pues tengo que asimilar de que aquí me voy a quedar, de que ya no puedo estar en Estados Unidos con mi familia de que ellos van a tener que estar viniendo aquí a, a visitarme y no yo poder ir para Estados Unidos, de que ya no tengo más opciones.
no tengo más papeles donde cortar, tratar de asimilar las cosas y ojalá que mi familia entienda de que yo no puedo estar allá y de que juntos no vamos a poder estar para siempre, digamos así. Yeah, and so I wanted to end with this one uh, because I feel like it illustrates uh, in some ways more than any of the others, uh, at least to us on a very personal level, the precarity in which the um, people that we worked with, many of them, were living. Um, so he wanted to be with his family, he wanted to be with them forever. Uh, it's actually kind of the opposite. Um, <coughs> Gerardo, uh, we heard about a month ago from one of the other uh, indigent people that he had introduced us to, um, who was working in a shelter, watching the door, and he didn't pay attention to the guys who came out of the taxi in ski masks. Uh, and he opened the door, and they came in, and they shot him right away. They were um, narcos who were targeting people who were dealing drugs in that shelter. Um, and so he was part of that <coughs> carnage. Um, the, pe the people who contacted me um, informed me that actually they didn't know his name. Uh, they thought they knew him as El Gato. Uh, and apparently no one knew his name there. He, they were worried that he was unidentified in the morgue and that they were going to toss his body into a common grave because that's what they do with unidentified bodies. Um, they had no way of contacting his family. So <clears throat> fortunately, this guy had my phone number. We knew his name, and, and Guillermo was able to go with him, to, with that guy, to uh, identify the body. Um, but we actually couldn't do anything more than that. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't able to get any kind of identi identif identifying information. He didn't have any identification, um, and without it, we could not actually remove him from the morgue and get him a burial. Um, we, I, I know the names of his common-law wife and his daughters, but I have no way of contacting them. Um, maybe I could like hire a detective. Anyway, nobody in his family knows that he's passed away. Um, and so this story, I think, illustrates really well um, the precarious state in which a lot of people end up when they get deported. And we wanted to end with that. Thank you all for coming uh, and uh, listening to us. And I hope you go to our website and watch more of our, our videos and learn more about uh, what deportation means. We've got like a whole lot of people from our team here, and we're really happy to hear any kind of questions or comments that anyone anyone has uh, about anything that you saw today. I, I, I know you worked one before. How did you? You're doing something that is so very different. How did you come about? do something like this, which is really great, thank you, but it's, it's, a, it's a big commitment. How did this happen? <laughs> how, did, how did it happen? Professor of literature. Yeah, so I have a, my, a background, I have a PhD in comparative literature. Mm -hmm. um, I have a background in gender studies and also border studies and kind of mm -hmm. had an interest in, in these kinds of topics and uh, anyway, ended up uh, with uh, an opportunity at UC Davis to work with someone there who, who is an expert in digital storytelling and was, uh, and, and there, were, there were a couple of us, uh, several students, or not these students, but maybe a previous generation of students who were interested in figuring out how to do community-based work without it being an intervention. And we were attracted by this digital storytelling idea that we had, we had heard about that seemed to be something that anybody could do and that would allow uh, us to do community-based work uh, without uh, imposing an agenda on a community and instead would be working in a co very deeply collaborative way and, and in a sense serving a community. And so we did a project on, uh, it, was, it was called Sexualidades Campesinas and it, was, it had a, a, something that was related to interest that we had in the, in the group. It was a small project that didn't end up getting very far. Um, we, we do have a website and there's like five videos there. But when this topic became, became of deportation, became a kind of an obsession with me, uh, and I discovered, and I did a call, and I discovered many more people, uh, people who responded to the call and were interested, passionate about the, the idea of making this uh, kind of process and these people's experiences visible. Uh, 
so yeah, it's like a kind of a transformation of from doing literary analysis, but but uh, it's it's their stories. It's 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 our it's our world. This is a, a humanities project, right? So we're not doing it's not anthropology. We're not doing ethnography. Um, we're we're helping stories get created uh, that we think need to get told and, and analyzed. Thank you so much. Um, it's, you know, even if someone is familiar with these stories, just seeing them again just has a really strong, um, really strong impact, especially that, that past story. But um, I actually wanted to ask you a question, maybe all of you that are involved as well. Um, how would you see, I mean, what kind of, because a lot of the people that you're talking to are basically in shelters or didn't have family members. And I'm wondering, you know, when you're saying, particularly in, the, in Mexico, that these stories aren't or known, or what kind of, like, I guess, I'm wondering how do you think that this, that, like, what, what kind of intervention do you hope that this can have? Um, you know, I, I can understand the kind of political intervention it could have in the U.S., but I'm wondering how in the context of Mexico how we see this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. You could mention something, maybe like providing more services or making um, this type of community aware of where they could go for, like, shelter. And I think the video that we just showed also one of the previous ones that mentions that they need like to have like a system to know who's there, maybe like have a contact mm -hmm. of like a phone number for mm -hmm. like someone. I think that's like a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, just for if something happens like throw head out those case. Like it's hard to find your family members. So mm -hmm. I think having like I would just call it like a program or something with like a desayunador del padre chava would help to have access to mm -hmm. these um the people who are there and maybe, I don't know, when something like this happens, just mm -hmm. to like help them out. So I think that's one of the things that I hope come out from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I mean, we, we went into this, I mean, it was it was actually, I don't know if you can kind of imagine how much work it is to, to make like a little five minute video. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so it was like a, a huge amount of work. Our, our goal here was to create the archive. And we imagined all kinds of things that could happen with the archive. I think there are a lot of people who can, who can use it in different ways. And so what's important to us is to do events like this where we can get, get some word out uh, so, so people can begin to, using it in different ways. Um, but, uh, you know, one, there, so there are kind of practical things that, that one can try to, try to do with it, such as, you know, using a video as evidence in an asylum case. But uh, also, I think, uh, I don't remember if it was Annalisa or uh, Sarah mentioned. There's there's a process of care that uh, becomes very important in the process of making the the videos. That um, is, I think, uh, something that I've learned is valuable in itself. So just to give people who don't have uh, who, in, in many cases, these are stories that we, we could tell that they have like never told them in their complete form before. And so to give them a platform to do it. Some of them wanted to, Gerardo, I think, he asked me for a USB, two USBs, to give a copy to his daughters and his sister. I think he wanted to communicate to them. He wanted to communicate to the world, and he understood that that could work or not. But some of them have very personal reasons for wanting to uh, tell their stories, or just personal. Some of them, I felt like there was also a, a cathartic process that was really healing for them to be able to tell the stories. And um, so that in itself is also valuable in a space where, you know, I felt like I've been wanting to use, rather than the word precarity, to talk about this space, I started playing with the word decarity. These are people that nobody cares about, right? Activism in the US about deportation is about trying to save the people. But once they get deported, they're like off the map, and these are people who can't appeal their cases in just about any case they can't appeal. They have no recourse to appeal, no legal resource to appeal, even permanent residents who have been deported. So um, that's kind of how I see it. No I have a question. First of all, thank you for your work to you and all, all the team. Sounds like an exciting project. I'm wondering if uh, you're thinking about expanding it, going beyond the border, into Central Mexico, other countries, to kind of compile these stories. Uh, recently in Mexico, Guadalajara, Mexico City, there's a lot of stories, you know, in, in the bus station. Anywhere I went, I heard stories. I heard references to these. Yeah. So I was wondering if you were thinking of expanding this yeah. project. Yeah, thank, thank you. And so actually, when, when the website went live 
very soon after that, I got uh, contacted, there's a contact page on there from someone from La Universidad de Guadalajara, and it's a place where there's a lot of uh, history in doing migration studies. Uh, so they want to actually join the project, and also people from El Tec de Monterrey. Uh, and so we're going to work with those universities to expand initially to Guadalajara, Mexico City, and Oaxaca, and, and Mexico, kind of Mexico City, Mexico State region in Oaxaca, and yeah, and it will be different. So Tijuana is a very fruitful place to, to work and think about deportation because a lot of people arrive there and a lot of people stay there, and I think more than anywhere else in Mexico, people who get deported stay there, even if they have absolutely no root uh, or previous experience in Tijuana. Um, whereas probably most of the people who end up in, in Jalisco are going back to a place where they had lived before, at least, even if it was not recently. Um, but, uh, and so it, I think it will be interesting for, important for the project to get that kind of diversity of people not staying, lingering near the border, the, the, the Sana Norte, the kind of ghetto that's right up against the border is full of deported people who like, will not like even move to another neighborhood that's a few blocks away from, Gerardo lived a half a block from the border. Um, and so to get the diversity from, from that perspective also, um, there's all different kinds of profiles of people. So if, if someone is working in Oaxaca, we will hope to get some profiles of some indigenous people who have been deported. Um, and so, I, I, yeah, we definitely want to do that, and, and it will be very good. We're, at the moment, really uh, able to work in Mexico. And I don't think that we can, we have, we have a, even a plan to find resources to, to work more broadly. It's ex expensive to like, expand to South America or somewhere else. It's still open then. Um, as I was listening and watching some of these, I found myself having a lot of thoughts and questions about the political scenarios, but also sort of the policies, the laws that these people had kind of um, had, had so defined their lives. And so I know that you all made a decision not to make this more like a documentary, but how hard was it not to use this as a forum to just say more about those policies or say more about the politics? I mean, did you have to really pull back? Um, was there a tension there in terms of your own interests and intentions, or you just were really clear that it was not going to be a kind of, um, this is what the laws are, and this is what people can do or not do, and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer, my, and I don't know if somebody else wants to answer, but my, my, you know, the dialogue that I would have with somebody would be, well, we're doing this project, and we feel that people don't know enough about deportation, we feel that they don't understand who deported people are, what, what their, the diversity of their experiences are, um, what kind of message would be interesting to get to the world? And so, uh, and, and I think people really understood that this is going on the internet, it can reach a whole wide audience in the U.S. and in Mexico, and that it has a political potential. And so... I think that everyone who participated saw some kind of a political potential. Uh, but it was important, for me at least, not to have them be um, spokespeople for my politics. And so I tried to just dialogue with them and hear what their politics were and try to figure out how to represent that. Does anyone, anyone else want to? I think, a little bit, I, think, yeah. I think most of us like tried to do the, the same thing, and I think it depended whether it went into policy or like procedures. Like it depended on on the participant who was making the story. Like I worked with a participant that right off the bat, like he wanted to like talk about the paperwork mm -hmm. that you have to get when you mm -hmm. get there, and mm -hmm. the first few documents that you need so you can get by. And so, but it came out of him, and it was very clear to him, like from the beginning. So he went through with that and it was that and also he wanted to talk to his daughters. So I think it did come up maybe in some stories, um, but if it came up and it ended up in the final product, it was mostly um, depending on, on the on what the, the creator wanted mm -hmm. to do with it. Somebody want to add something? So I actually learned about like how to become a national United States based from a participant who was mm -hmm. creating his case based on that and mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to like 
metal in the U.S. with that. So for me, it was like a learning experience knowing all this. I had like some ideas of it, but through the participants, especially working with the Puerto veterans, you learn more. Mm -hmm. So I think it was like a give and take from both sides. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I learned a lot about things I had no idea about, mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's a great potential of these videos for a lot of people in the U.S. who don't have any idea about mm -hmm. the laws and could be like a stimulus people to find out more. And I, yeah, I don't think that the participants, um, most of them, really like felt like teaching mm -hmm. about those laws, but mm -hmm. actually they had like more principles that they wanted people to understand, like. Um, uh, you know, what, why are people caged mm -hmm. because of crossing the border? Mm -hmm. So they're kind of like bigger things that they wanted to say, and then probably what we could do now um, is maybe do that research and, and taking things that they've said in the videos, you know, write up uh, an academic document mm -hmm. that does explain it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's like our job to do the learning. Yeah, I think I think that's what I learned. Yeah. Is there a question in the back? Oh, uh, my question is about the methodology of um, the choosing of the subjects. Like how is that done? How do you deal with uh, I'm from the final, so I know there's a lot of stories, no? And how do you deal with the selection of that? The ethical implications of the selection of the subjects? Yeah, so I mean, I don't know if we can say that we selected. Uh, so what we did prior to, to going there was, so we were working with people from El, El Colegio, um, I went down a lot prior to the teams going down there, and what we did was explore a lot of spaces and make a lot of connections. And so we were able to uh, kind of uh, introduce people from our team to different spaces, different uh, people or organizations where they were, would be likely to meet uh, people who had been deported, also people from El Colegio, some of them new people that they had worked with previously and things, things like that. And so. Uh, as we were going, we tried to uh, ensure a certain amount of diversity. And so, for example, it was very easy to work with the deported veterans and the Madre Soñadoras because they're political organiza activist organizations who like knew right away uh, what to do with the videos. They're like media savvy. And so they like were very hungry to work with us. But we didn't want them to dominate. And so we had to try to get into other spaces. The this, That space that I was trying to kind of <coughs> concentrate a lot on of the kind of shelters and kind of semi-homeless people uh, where a, a lot of the people on the team were not really comfortable going with, with very good reason um, and it was very hard to work there um, but it was it was important for us to get that there, there are some things that we didn't get we, we worked hard Sarah sat hours at the LGBTQ center down near the Revolution Arch where they told her, somebody's going to come in, and they're going to want to work with you. And then that never happened. Um, and so there are some kinds of diversity that we weren't able to get. Um, and that's part of the reason why I think it's good that we try to keep expanding the project. But um, so we, we were, we debated, we talked about that. Like, what is this archive going to look like? And, and how can we ensure, we can't, we can't make it representative but we can try to make it as diverse as we can. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that it's very important what you're doing, but it, like, it's leaving me kind of unsettled <laughs> in this, and oh, it's obvious why, but it, one of the reasons for that is, and perhaps when, what, what Carlos is suggesting, talking to people who, are, who went back to Oaxaca, Guadalajara, it's more clear because to me, the, the word that you use, there are people that nobody cares about them. So uh, uh, listening to them, it seems like the problem is huge in the sense that there's like this stereotype about Mexico as family tradition, but it's nowhere to be seen around here, you know? And perhaps the people who stay in Tijuana is because they want to be close to home. But it seems like there's no other home or other family elsewhere. So it seems like it, 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 it's a, the problem of a, a broken social fabric for the whole country, the fact that this is even possible. So it, in a sense, I get thinking about uh, what is still the question of Estelle is, wouldn't it be nice to have like your own take at the end? I mean, your own something that you help people think globally 
what this means on both sides of the border. Perfect. It would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so th this is the first time, this week is the first time that we've met since we finished. So we, we were in Tijuana from, in, for a month in June, July. We actually spent a whole lot of the summer finishing, doing kind of post-production on a lot of the work. Uh, and there's still videos that we're working on now from cases that have come up later that some of us are, are working on. But we, we sat down to meet and try to figure out what we wanted to do ourselves with this. You know, we, we want on the one hand to, to dedicate some time and energy to getting the word out. So we're also going to, we were also talking about making a plan to do a uh, collective volume where each of us, because we're from mm -hmm. all different fields, we're from... Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> literary studies, uh, anthropology, um, uh, performance studies, um, history, uh, migration studies. Uh, we have a diversity of backgrounds and diversity of kind of interests in the material that we're going to, I think, be able to bring. I don't know if we're going to come up with the great thing that you're asking for, <laughs> uh, um, but maybe maybe we'll be able to, to move it in, in that direction. Now, now that we've had time to like get over the, mm -hmm. to some degree, like some of the, the emotional process of, of working on the project itself and, and then start to think analytically about it. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much for sharing the very personal narrative of work. So I was thinking if, if you have like thought about that, uh, the importance of literally the voice in, in this video because mm -hmm. to me, like the most touching uh, um, element of m most of those videos was literally the voice, like the rain, the pace, the rhythm, especially uh, the voices of, of the women, perhaps because there are like certain gender scripts, you know, for, for and also certain genres uh, conventions, like in testimonial. But there is something really powerful about the voice, and since you already frame it, you know, so powerfully and so painfully, as you know, um, as a sort of collective uh, of those who are not care. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact paraphrasing, but you know, those who are not care about or something like that. Uh, so I was wondering, what does it mean to be interpolated? By those, because a voice is literally that. It, it's a demand of, it's a form of interpolation. And then I was also thinking on the idea of echo, because um, you know these are obviously mediated narratives. They deal with media, but they are also mediated at many different levels. And an echo is a form of repetition of a voice, right? Um, and I was wondering that it was kind of such a cool paradox, but also kind of poetic, but crude, in a cool manner also, that the echoes come back, and yet literally, you know, in some cases, the voices don't. So, I don't know, it's just that it's something that really struck me, the mm -hmm. voice. In, in, in the yeah, I'll just comment one thing about, about that. Um, so, a colleague in political science at Davis uh, decided that he, I don't think, I don't know if he's formulated completely, but he wants to do a study uh, working with the audio. Uh, and uh, I think that he wants to do a kind of reception study and try, try to understand, because I think that he had the same reaction that you did, that it was the audio that hit him hardest, and I think wants to understand uh, how that might work with this kind of product. Thank you, thank you. Are you, are you John Carlos? Yes. Mucho <laughs> gusto. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask about, um, I think someone mentioned like the possibility or potential for like, traumatizing or re-traumatizing effects of storytelling. And so um, I wanted to hear more about what the team, how the team thought about or dealt with that. Um, and then also like along those lines, how the people in the videos are interacting with the project at this point, now that the team is back. Does someone want to try the trauma question? I raised that um, concern, and I think it's really complicated to understand it globally. I think it's individual. I mean, we all had, all of us as individuals had individual relationships with people, um, and each one of those was mediated or negotiated in different ways, and there were many moments of decision making um, and learning, moments of learning. 
And so I think for each of us and for each participant, the experience was completely different. Um, and I think we were all changed by it. So I would say that um, it's about listening and being able to respond to our praxis. So, so looking at the way that we're working and seeing um, what kinds of relationships it's generating and whether that needs to be changed in terms of methodological choices, so like a reflexive methodology. Um, but I don't think that, th that we really know like what's the right way. Um, I think that asking someone to tell you about a traumatic experience can always potentially be painful for, for everyone. And, um, it seems like it's also necessary. Yeah, and so we need to be like really sensitive to, so we needed to really form a relationship with the person. And, and we, you know, we were working mostly one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one, and so it allowed us to do that gradually. Um, although we would often start very early with a discussion of something that was traumatic. But for example, I was working with one of, one of the guys, um, one of the deported veterans um, who had been a combat veteran. And um, so the, the activist guys were saying, oh, I want, it would be great if one of the combat vets uh, does a story. And so, you know, he was telling me this story. This, the story. You could watch it, it's called uh, uh, Permanent Residence, I think. He has that with an, an interrogation. Uh, it's like much more, um, uh, I don't know, it was much, uh, he's like a big burly guy who became a police officer in Tijuana. Um, but it's a much more emotional story than I thought it would be. And he started going there to talk about his experience in combat, which is like a whole other trauma. And I think that part of the reason why he ended up getting in trouble after being in the armed services was a post-traumatic stress from what he had undergone in combat. He like touched on it, and I realized that I couldn't push him there. Um, and so we, we let, you know, the story took its shape. That got in there because he felt it needed to be there, but he was not prepared to talk about that trauma with me. But you can see, like, in the video that he gets very, very um, emotional um, anyway, talking about his deportation. But, yeah, we had to improvise a whole lot of things. Um, one of the things that we talked to, we're talking about doing is defining, because that, that was the word we used all along. We need to be really sensitive. We need to improvise. We need to, be, to know what they need. And, and we need to respond to their needs and make these their stories. Um, we decided that, well, actually, what we need to do now is define our method. Now that we've had it, now that we've lived it, we actually did have a method that we can define that's not what the Center for Digital Storytelling dictates. It has a whole lot that is inspired from that, but we ended up doing a whole lot of things very similarly throughout the, the time that we were, we were there. So that's part of what we're going to try to write up. Uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to follow my other question, which I think is related, is how the, what the follow-up is then with um, people who made the videos and um, are part of the project for the website. Yeah, so one, one of the follow-ups is going to be the next big presentation that we've planned is in Tijuana, at the Centro Cultural de Tijuana. And so we are in touch with most of them, those who can be reached. And so, of course, we're going to invite them there. We're going to uh, have to um, get some people released from shelters, right? Because they need to check in by a certain amount of time, and they're not by a certain time, and they're not allowed out at night. Uh, so it's an evening presentation. We're going to get them permission to come, um, and uh, you know, give them that forum. Um, you know, we're in touch so, so with a lot of them, so Sarah's going to send these responses to Estet, which I think is something that she's really going to appreciate, knowing that her video was shown to people who cared about it and who are like interested in responding to a question that she has. Um, I wrote, I, we did a presentation like this in Davis yesterday, and when we showed one of the videos of one of the guys I worked with, I texted him, that's how we communicate, and uh, he texted back this morning. It's like, oh, did they like it? Um, uh, and so, you know, to, the, to whatever kind of relationship we uh, are able to, to maintain with people uh, who are able to stay in touch with, um, we, we, I think, are following through on them, on those. But there's some people who, who you know, we're, we're, we don't have any way of being in touch with them. They, they, have no, they have no phone, they have no email. And the only way, it was, it was hard working with some people because you would have to look for them. They didn't have a fixed place of living. 
there is a question over there. Yeah, so I work with a lot of underserved youth in the Bay Area, and a lot of them identify as Latinx or Chicanx. I feel like this is something that I really want them to like learn and mm -hmm. hear about. Yeah. But how should I approach it without it being like showing the videos without it being too triggering or like too traumatic? Because a lot of them do resonate with this topic. <laughs> I mean, the the best thing you can do if we could we could talk and I could try to find some videos that you would think we, that, that I would think might be less triggering than others. But this is this is triggering. This is like not meant to be something that uh, doesn't trigger an emotional response. I don't think it's it's easy to tell a story like this in a way that wouldn't trigger an emotional response. And so I mean maybe the thing to do is is warn them, um, tell them what it's about, and ask them whether they feel that they're prepared to watch something like this. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have like zero questions, also like a series of questions, but um, like a lot of these are very much like showings, it seems like what you're doing, like you're showing them, you're talking about the archive, but I want you to talk a little bit more about the archive itself, and I guess, how do you see people interacting with it, how do you see people sharing it, how do you see people, I guess, arriving to it, what do they do after that, also the fact that it's on YouTube, I guess, how does that work, kind of the same questions asking about the website itself, how are people interacting with these videos on YouTube, I guess, what's the effect of having these videos on YouTube? And just, yeah, I'd just like, like to hear a little more about the website. The, the decision to have them on YouTube was mm -hmm. purely practical. It was so that the website itself didn't have to post all the data mm -hmm. from the videos. Okay. So, um, originally when, when we decided to go that route, it was to make the, the website lighter. Mm -hmm. um, because of stuff I've learned in this and yeah. stuff. <laughs> but, um, so, I don't, I mean, through YouTube, we're able to see how many people are visiting which videos and get, a, get an idea of what videos, like, get more views, which we can make any conjectures about, except like, you know, maybe speculate that maybe one participant shared it more mm -hmm. on their social media or with friends than like others mm -hmm. because sometimes um, as it is currently a lot of them the ones that have the resources do communicate a lot through social media mm -hmm. with their family over here or even with us I think a lot of you um, had them on Facebook I believe I'm not sure I didn't have Facebook at the time mm -hmm. but um, so that was the purpose of the YouTube really like the, mm -hmm. the archive is meant to be posted in the Humanizando la Deportación website. Um, so YouTube was like a technical and practical decision. It wasn't at the time meant to be for dissemination, I think, or well, not, not especially, but it, but it can be. But it's it's not really different than the, than the website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's in the public sphere, and so that was there all along. Our our idea was that this needs to be out there. Uh, in ways that we know we can't control. And so, of course, we're working to kind of uh, hone some of the, uh, the explanatory information on the website. Uh, we're working on a press kit. Uh, we're planning, uh, pre right, we'll, we'll gradually be planning. We don't have resources or uh, travel funds, but to, to do uh, more uh, in-person presentations at conferences and other opportunities that that come up, um, but we, we know that we can't control what happens with, with the information. We can try to frame it a little bit, uh, but I, I personally am happy with just it being out there, rather than uh, if, if, if it's just talking heads, talking politics about deportation, if this is another voice at the table, then that's really great, um, because this is a voice from someone who's talking from experience. Oh, yeah. So I think we're, we're done. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> really appreciate your engagement. I hope that you tell other people about the site. And I hope you take some time to watch some videos when you have some time.